My name is Eddie Joe. I'm an intensivist who happens to love evidence-based medicine because at the end of the day, I want to take the best care I possibly can of my patients and know all the nuances of everything in critical care to the best of my ability. I'm only human, so I do make mistakes just like you do. Anyway, thanks for clicking on this video. Please click the thumbs up button now in advance so you don't forget to do it later or do it later, it's up to you. Honestly, clicking the thumbs up button if you learn absolutely anything helps the YouTube algorithm promote my page and therefore more people will be able to see this and hopefully learn from what I'm doing. You could also hit the subscribe button. I plan on making more videos in the future, more content and all that stuff will be educational. In addition, I have an Instagram page where you can follow my handle at EddieJoeMD where I routinely take apart journal articles and stuff that you can learn from there. On Twitter, I have kind of a different thing going on, but also at EddieJoeMD. And all the links and articles and everything I basically run through ultimately goes on my website, www.EddieJoeMD.com. So follow me there. Anyway, now getting to this article. And I'm trying this format where I'm basically doing a screen recording of my uh, screen recording of my iPad where you can see the time and the date that I'm making this video. The year is 2019. So I reserve the right to change my opinion on all this as more data comes out. But this study is from, as I, that didn't quite work the way I wanted it to. This, this, this article is from 2015. So I actually read this article when it came out and since then it has influenced my practice and for the last four years, I've tried to influence other people's practice, but just teaching one person at a time about how you cannot use or should not use procalcitonin to roll in and roll out infection as an absolute black and white test is not the way to go. And I appreciate the authors of this article as I go ahead and I box them there because they actually went through all of this trouble to make this article. and. Hopefully they feel good about themselves because I happen to like this article a lot. And so the article is titled Diagnostic Accuracy of CRP, but I'm not going to talk about C-reactive protein at all. I'm going to focus on, as I go through all here, I'm going to focus on the procalcitonin. In suspected community acquired pneumonia adults visiting the emergency department. So for my ER people, I feel you, you guys get a lot of heat out there, but I understand the job is tough. And I'm gonna quickly go through the abstract where obviously everybody knows that community acquired pneumonia requires prompt treatment, but the diagnosis is correct. I sympathize again for my ER colleagues who now based on the 2019 surviving sepsis guidelines have to make the, ter the determination within one, ye one year, psh, within one hour and start patients on treatment. I just think that's a little bit bonkers, but that's a story for another day. Um, and so basically what they did is that they uh, did a CT scan on these patients um, and they also did a, I think I already said CT scan on this patient. But anyway, they had an adjudication committee, these people right over here, who were composed of a pulmonologist, an infectious disease specialist, and a radiologist who, using multiple tools, determined whether the patient had uh, different probabilities of community-acquired pneumonia. And so... This was a multi-center prospective study, and they evaluated the impact of a CT scan on community-acquired pneumonia diagnosis. They also looked at CRP and procalcitonin. Um, again, my main thing that I'm gonna focus on in this study is the procalcitonin. I'm going to ignore the CRP. Sorry about that for those of you who uh, wanna know everything. You guys will just have to read the article yourself. And what they did is that they had 200 patients with suspected community-acquired pneumonia. And of those, they had 98 patients who had definitive community-acquired pneumonia, eight who were probable, 23 as possible, and it was excluded in 71 of these patients. Anyway, things I'm going to discuss, not gonna go into it right now, right this minute, but I will, I promise, is the area under the curve, because we need to discuss that. We also need to discuss something called a uh, uter, or, yeah, no, whatever, I'll get to that in a second, which is also a statistical analysis tool. Um, but one of the things that they found in the results is that there was no procalcitonin cutoff that resulted in a satisfactory positive or negative predictive values. What they concluded in this 
is that procalcitonin is insufficient to confirm the community acquired pneumonia diagnosis established by using a gold standard that includes a CT scan of the chest. So it also says that the diagnostic accuracy of these biomarkers is also insufficient to distinguish community acquired pneumonia, whether it's bacterial or viral. Take that into consideration because this is the whole, the whole argument of this video. You cannot use a single value procalcitonin to determine whether it's bacterial or viral. That lie that you, you were told during training, I was told the same lie. Hey, by the way, check a procalcitonin. If it's negative, it's likely viral. No, that's complete, utter nonsense. All right, let's go to, let me see if I can get this to swipe. Jeez. Okay, I guess I got to shrink this down. I'm skipping the whole introduction, methods, objectives. You could read this yourself. That's not the objective of this video. Sorry, as I scroll through, I might make you dizzy if I make you nauseous. Well, sorry. Uh, all throughout all the classifications. Let's go ahead and take a look here at this box plot. I am no expert in statistics whatsoever. I've basically taught myself as I've gone along because I feel it's important. So I'm going to kind of go through this with you as well. Let me see if I can get this to zoom in. Okay, cool. So here we're going to look at we're going to focus on two different uh, figures here on the box plot. Number one, the patients where community acquired pneumonia was excluded and those where community acquired pneumonia was definite. We're going to just go ahead and ignore these guys here in the middle. Hope that isn't too distracting. It's pretty distracting, so let me just ignore it. Let's do this then. All right, let's see if this works. Uh, I appreciate feedback on this because this is the first time I do all this. Anyway, simple way to uh, read a box plot is that this was the maximum that they got within the interquartile range, and this was the minimum. And then this right here, this one right there is the 25th percentile, and this one right here is the 75th percentile. Okay, so and then this is the median here in the middle. Let me do it in a different color. Maybe like that, you can see it more better. I know I'm not speaking properly. I'm just trying to entertain myself while I do this because if not, I'm getting bored. And then these guys over here are outliers. And so then these guys over here are outliers. It's kind of the same figure uh, persists when we look through this. Okay, so when we look at the procalcitonin values, right, you had a minimum and a maximum. So in patients who had community acquired pneumonia excluded there were patients who had a maximum of procalcitonin of 52.22. So negative, sorry, as I go through this, negative for infection, PCT of 52. That would make me bonkers if somebody told me, oh, but they have to have an infection because their procalcitonin is elevated. Well, here's some data to show you that it's not black and white. The same thing as the patients who had definitive community acquired pneumonia. There were people with positive community acquired pneumonia with a PCT that was equal to 0 0.02. If your rationale to give or withhold antibiotics depends on the procalcitonin, you're doing it completely wrong. And that's my takeaway point from this graph. If you differ in how you feel, well, let me know in the comment section below. I'm happy to, happy to discuss. But this was my takeaway from this particular uh, box plot is that you cannot count on the procalcitonin to tell you whether you have an infection or not. That whole black and white thing of negative procalcitonin means it's not infection, throw it out, forget it, pretend you never learned it. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, let's go to the next table that I wanted to show you, which is the one over here. All right, and let me see if I could get it to the right size. All right. So this one is talking about the area under the curve, okay? And just so that everybody is on the same page, the area under the curve, if it's equal to zero, that means the test is 100% wrong. And if the area under the curve is equal to one, that means the test is 100% right, okay? I know smiley faces doesn't make sense, whatever. Uh, read the article for yourself, study statistical analysis for yourself. But basically what it means is that the higher the area under the curve is, 
the better the test is, okay, to distinguish whether the patient has the disease or not. And in this case, the area under the curve was 0 0.65, which is closer to being good, but nevertheless, it's still not a perfect test. Once again, that's the objective of my whole thing. You cannot use procalcitonin in absolutes to determine whether the patient is infected or not. And then they took it one step further to this whole UDINS index. And what's the UDINS, the UDINS index? Well, here, let me just write it a little bit bigger. UDINS. And guys, to be honest with you, I didn't know what this meant. I had to look it up myself, okay? I'm not a statistical genius. That's my big disclaimer. I just look things up and interpret it. So if the UDINS is equal to, and I'm making up the Y, I don't know if it's actually a Y. If the UDINS is equal to zero, the test is useless. And if the UDINS is equal to one, that means the test is perfect. There's more, there's a lot more to this, but ultimately the UDINS index is 0 0.307, which is closer to useless than it is to perfect. I hope that this video really does change the way you look at procalcitonin because this is the takeaway I got out of this article where I can't find one single thing and one single analysis of this article either where they say that procalcitonin is useful to rule in and rule out uh, infection. It's suggestive of it, but it's not a perfect test. Okay. And I think that, that will conclude this video. I think I've rambled for long enough about all this nonsense. Again, if you learned anything whatsoever, please hit the like button because it really does help out the channel grow and it helps people get to the channel. Follow me on Instagram at EddieJoeMD. Also follow me on Twitter at EddieJoeMD. Check out my link to this uh, article at EddieJoeMD.com and I also do a bunch of fun stuff over there. Thanks again for checking out my channel. Hope you enjoyed this video. Take care. Bye.